Good afternoon and welcome to NACDL's Government Hacking and Criminal Cases webinar. I'm Jimena Musa. I'm the Senior Privacy and National Security Counsel here at NACDL. And I want to let you know that this webinar is a collaboration with NACDL's Public Defense Department and is funded in part by a grant from the Bureau of Justice Assistance. NACDL would like to thank BJA for its continued support of training for public defender, defense providers. Uh, just to quickly introduce who will be doing our webinar today, Colin Feynman is an assistant federal public defender in Tacoma, Washington, and has been defending clients charged with cyber offenses since joining that office in 2002. Paul Ohm is a professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center and a computer scientist who specializes in information privacy, computer crime law, intellectual property, and criminal procedure. Government hacking has been going on for some time without a lot of formal rules or laws or parameters. The playpen cases of which Colin has been defending are a particular string of cases in which hundreds of cases were charged both in the U.S. and internationally off of one warrant. And a lot of today's discussion will talk about the process of that and how much of the information was discovered. But the key here is Congress has actually never weighed in on whether or not the government should be hacking into people's computers, and if they should, under what circumstances. But recent changes to Rule 41 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure have opened up uh, the government's ability to do more and new types of hacking. And so we want to continue the discussion not just on the type of cases that have been, but a little bit about those changes and how these cases might go forward. NACDL this past spring, along with the ACLU and EFF, have published a guide titled Challenging Government Hacking in Criminal Cases, which was in your materials. So this webinar is a follow-up to that. After the webinar, you will receive an email with a link to a short survey. <coughs> We'd appreciate it if you could take a moment to provide us some feedback. Your feedback is important for NACDL to continue to provide trainings like this. We will be taking questions, but not until the end of the presentation. However, if there's a moment in the presentation where your question is pressing and key to understanding the presentation as it go goes forward, you can email it to me at jmusa at nacdl.org. Uh, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Colin. Thank you, Jumana. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, Paul. And uh, we have a lot of ground to cover today. So I'm going to give you a brief outline of the topics that we'll be covering. Uh, sort of in tag team as we go along. Uh, we're going to start with a uh, primer on Tor and uh, malware and hacking, a little bit of the history of some ha other hacking operations that Paul will be talking about to give you some background and context. Uh, and then there will be throughout an emphasis on uh, Operation Pacifier, which was an FBI uh, hacking operation that began uh, in uh, early 2016 involving a particular type of malware called a NIT or Network Investigative Technique. Uh, and we'll be interweaving uh, throughout the presentation uh, some of the lessons uh, that we've learned in the course of the NIT uh, litigation, which is continuing uh, and is now just starting to reach the courts of appeals uh, in several of the cases. We'll also be call, uh, alerting you to some of the uh, red flags and uh, investigatory challenges uh, to help you both spot and deal with uh, NIT and malware type cases uh, should they start coming your way uh, if you don't already have one of these cases. Uh, with one of the challenges being that uh, it can be difficult to know that you are actually dealing with a malware or hacking case uh, because the way that the complaints and some of the other documents um, are presented to defense counsel. We'll then be talking uh, somewhat briefly about uh, some of the outrageous governmental misconduct that's associated with Operation Pacifier, including some recent findings uh, in the Western District of Washington regarding uh, the FBI's violation of the law in connection with uh, Operation Pacifier. And this will be uh, both, I think, relevant both because of um, the truly outrageous nature of some of the law enforcement actions connected with the operation, and also because a lot of these cases are turning uh, in terms of relief for clients uh, on the question of good faith. Uh, Paul will also be talking about uh, federal rule of criminal procedure 41 and some of the uh, jurisdictional issues that have arisen. Uh, we'll be touching on the Fourth Amendment, uh, suppression area uh, issues, particularity, and Frank's issues in connection uh, with 
both Operation Pacifier and most more broadly uh, with government hacking. Uh, I will then spend some time on the discovery litigation uh, that has taken place in connection with Operation Pacifier. Uh, in my particular cases, that's actually where we met with success in terms of exclusion orders and ultimately the dismissal uh, of charges against our clients. Uh, and uh, through it all, uh, bear in mind that uh, NACTL's uh, manual on challenging government hacking uh, is also a, a good primer, a good starting place. Uh, if you get one of these cases, it even has sample motions. And uh, both Paul and I uh, are uh, happy to receive uh, queries not only during the course of the presentation, uh, but afterwards uh, if one of these cases or another malware case comes your way. So uh, with that uh, general overview of what we'll be covering, I'll turn the table over to Paul. Great. Uh, so let me give you uh, one more piece of background just uh, in case it's useful for understanding my vantage point. So I was at the Justice Department's Computer Crime and Intellectual Property section for four years, 2001 to 2005. And as you'll see, at the time there was a little bit of this activity, this government malware activity, but it was really a glimmer in the eye of most of the people at DOJ. And I am only talking today about kind of public information and nothing that I uh, kind of learned in any classified or, or, or um, other, otherwise limited setting. Okay, so for about 12 slides, uh, what I'd like to do is talk about some of the technological underpinnings of what we'll be discussing for the rest of the two hours. Um, my goal here is not to make anybody an expert when it comes to this technology, uh, but to give you some terminology to highlight, as Colin said, uh, importantly, kind of red flags you can look for in a case that lands on your desk that may involve malware but won't say malware anywhere within the, the docket itself. Um, I, I also want to raise uh, kind of to give you a background appreciation of some of the Fourth Amendment and other legal issues, um, a sense for the disruptions in the architecture of the internet that have given rise to the kind of deeply felt need, and I think it is a deeply felt need uh, among prosecutors to turn increasingly to malware. Um, and then toward the end of the two hours, we can talk about my predictions and Colin's predictions about where this goes next. Okay, so let's start, and I apologize that the beginning is kind of review for most of you, um, but let's start with a conventional pre-TOR, Colin's already used the word TOR, uh, which is a core technology we're gonna be talking about in a few slides. Uh, and what I wanna do, I hope you can all see the mouse pointer here. I'm gonna use these a lot in these first few slides. Um, so this is a highly stylized uh, representation of what a pre-TOR online investigation looked like. Um, and so I'm not going to go over every last detail on this detailed slide, but what you have at the top is what I've labeled computer A. Computer A has an IP address, uh, and for you know most or a lot of investigations, this IP address is a unique identifier. Computer A is the only computer on the internet that is associated with that IP address. Um, down here in computer B, we have the site of some sort of criminal behavior. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot over the next two hours about child pornography websites, um, but this could be any sort of conduct online that inspires the attention of law enforcement. Um, computer B, because it is a full participating part of the internet, also has one of these unique identifiers, IP addresses, and so that's labeled here at the bottom. Um, and communications from a to B travel through a provider, uh, and then the universal symbol for things that happen on the internet but need not be detailed is this big cloud, um, and then pop out at a second provider system and then ultimately to the destination, and the destination sends a return message. What I've just described applies to web browsing, it applies to email, it applies to any uh, instant messaging, any transaction that occurs on the internet. And again, in a pre-TOR age, there was an intrinsic amount of visibility to law enforcement, to the FBI, to state law enforcement, um, in activities that occurred in this sort of setting. Um, most importantly, the internet is awash, awash in kind of routine uh, uh, record keeping that we tend to call log file keeping. Um, and so again, in a really stylized fashion, when I click here, you'll see one example of what I tell my students is a depiction of the internet crime scene. In a pre-tour world, you would go, let's say, to computer B. Perhaps it's a child pornography site that you have kind of searched and seized. 
you would look for a file in particular called the web log file. This shows you every single transaction on that website. Every single time somebody visited that site for any piece of content, an entry is made in a file like this. And in this stylized example, um, you look at the last line, you see that uh, a given IP address at a given date and time requested a given um, sort of content. And that's kind of memorialized here. And the bottom line is, if I click back for a second, this IP address at the bottom that ends 213, exactly the same as the IP address in that last row. And so now all you have to do is find out who is associated with that IP address. Okay, I'm leaving out a lot of detail because I really want to get to what's happened to this kind of conventional picture that I've described. So what has happened is the rise uh, and spread of a technology called Tor. Um, Tor stands for the onion router. And, and one really interesting piece of it, uh, uh, of the backstory here is this is a government creation. Uh, the, the Naval Research Lab actually underwrote most of the kind of initial development, although now it's, it's in nonprofit hands. What is Tor? Tor is often described as a way to use encryption to create virtual tunnels uh, to protect your communication in more than one way from the sort of attribution that we talked about on the last slide. Uh, and so let me kind of show you one of Tor's diagrams. Um, in this diagram and, and the next one I'm going to show you, um, it looks a lot like the conventional IP focused investigation I showed you two slides ago. The difference is this green line. This green line is the stylized idea that a person using a Tor client like this computer over here to speak to a web server like this computer over on the right um, is not using that transparent log file focused sort of IP conversation that we were describing, but instead is using, and this is kind of where I'm going to hide some of the technical detail in, in uh, just hand waving, in a lot of really clever encryption. Okay, a lot of really clever encryption creates what we call this kind of encrypted tunnel between the Tor client and the destination. And let me highlight a few things about how Tor works in this like very conventional sense. The beauty of Tor, and like the geek in me just wants to go on and on about how elegant and well executed it is, is that if Tor is implemented correctly, you see how we have all these hops from Tor client to entry guard, middle relay, exit relay. The entire point of Tor is that at any given point in that network, the only thing the computer knows is the IP address of the computer immediately before it in the conversation and the IP address of the computer after it. So this middle ray relay, for example, is completely in the dark, really, about the conversation that it's transmitting because all it knows is that the entry guard, which is some random computer, and the exit relay have asked it to help transmit this message. The middle relay doesn't know the Tor client's IP address. It doesn't know the destination's IP address. Because of encryption, it doesn't know any of the content that has been send and sent and received. Uh, it is not that it's really difficult to kind of uh, suss out this information. It's impossible because of the cryptography. OK. Um, a couple of other things I want to say. One is, who are these computers in the Tor network? Well, uh, again, hiding some of the details, there are other people on the globe who have installed and used Tor. Um, so one of the things that happens when you install Tor, unless you turn this feature off, you also agree to participate in the global encryption network that is Tor. Um, and so uh, this is kind of getting outside the scope of the talk, but one thing, one risk you accept by installing a Tor client is that there might be activity that looks <laughs> suspicious that seems to be coming from your computer. Okay, that's the first thing I want to say. This means that Tor is intrinsically international. Um, in ways that will cause all sorts of problems that we'll talk about in the next two hours. So this entry guard might be in the United States, but the middle relay might be in China, and the exit relay might be in Russia. Um, and of course, every one of those kind of cross-border communications causes a lot of headaches for uh, law enforcement. The second really fundamental thing you need to understand, especially for Operation Pacifier, is notice that in this diagram, the uh, connection from the exit relay to the destination is not green. It's this dotted red line. In fact, one of the beautiful things about Tor is you can use Tor to protect your identity but still surf the public web. So this doesn't have to be some kind of nefarious suspected criminal site. It could be Google. It could be YouTube. It could be some site 
for example, that your country doesn't want you to have access to, you can use Tor to get back onto the public internet and that's what's indicated by this dotted red line. And so what that means is that there was a stage in the evolution of Tor where a lot of people were installing Tor clients. They were using it to kind of mask their identity and behavior on the internet, but the destinations they were visiting were still pretty transparent to law enforcement. Right? You still knew that this website was somewhere in North Carolina. You knew its IP address. You could kick down a door and seize this computer. That's now all changed. Why has that changed? Because Tor has a second feature called hidden services. And with apologies, this is probably the one point in the talk where I just have to hide the most technical detail because I don't have three hours to go into it. The idea here with um, the hidden services is we no longer have this dotted red line. We no longer have a website that lives on the kind of traditional public internet that has an IP address. Instead, we cram the server, which is labeled Bob here, we cram the server into Tor itself. So notice in this diagram that the connection to Bob is also green. That's just a standard Tor connection. But the bottom line is when Alice wants to talk to Bob through a lot of kind of technical detail that I'm omitting, Alice and Bob can have that conversation without Bob ever living on the public internet. Most importantly, nobody knows Bob's IP address. Right? And so one way to think about the difference between Tor and Tor Hidden Services is that Tor is about protecting the users of the world from kind of having their, uh, their trail tracked. Tor Hidden Services gives that same sort of protection to the servers of the world. Okay. Um, and so that's hidden services. You'll also hear hidden services described as the dark net or the dark web. So what does it look like to surf Tor hidden services? Well, here's one of the most infamous Tor hidden service websites ever. This is a screenshot of a website called Silk Road. Silk Road um, was eventually taken down by law enforcement uh, for drug activity uh, and other illegal kind of contraband that it was selling. Um, and, and the reason this slide is here is to show you that surfing a dark net or a hidden service looks a lot like surfing the regular web. It appears in your browser, your browser protected by Tor, of course. Um, the probably only big cosmetic difference is that this is what a URL looks like on the dark net. Um, it ends with .onion instead of .com or .net or .org. And that's kind of your browser and computer's way of knowing, I'm going to get this content, if I can, on the Tor network without ever leaving the Tor network. OK. So let me do this next slide quickly. If there are questions about it, I'm happy to revisit it at the end. This is kind of my former DOJ's uh, approach to summarize the way that these two technologies, Tor and Hidden Services, have disrupted um, what was the status quo of investigation and have pushed law enforcement to think about things like malware. So let's just do each of these rows quickly. Um, how valuable are IP addresses in these three technologies? In the traditional world, I call them a gold mine. They really led directly to the next step in the investigation. In Tor, they're mostly useless. And in hidden services, they don't even exist. I can never know anybody's IP addresses. <laughs> How likely is it that there are rich log files that I'm going to encounter when I kick down that door in North Carolina? Uh, in traditional cases, quite high. In Tor and Tor Hidden Services, low to non-existent. Right? Um, why is it non-existent in the right column? Because if you're going to go to the trouble of setting up your server to be hi a hidden service, you're probably also going to not keep any of those log files. Uh, or you're going to do your best not to keep them. Um, this third one, we won't say much about till the very end, but I've already teed it up for you. What are the odds that an investigation stays within the United States in a traditional case, high to moderate? In Tor and Tor Hidden Services, you know, all bets are off. Um, one study has shown that only 18% of Tor clients at any given time are in the United States. Um, and remember, there are always three hops in a Tor conversation. And so the odds that one of those computers will be in a jurisdiction that doesn't really play nice with US law enforcement is quite high, um, which makes this a really, really challenging sort of thing. Um, and then the last one is one that kind of I think a lot about and I, I, I hope gets uh, some attention, which is even though we might think of kind of the internet investigations as this kind of still cutting edge sort of law enforcement, it really isn't. Like some of these. Uh, investigative techniques are decades old now um, and you have not only the feds but state and local law enforcement who are really adept at what it means to find crime online, 
take IP addresses and eventually um, find a computer that they want to search and seize, right? Um, so I think in many ways one of the most important things that has occurred is that Tor and Tor Hidden Services has disrupted the comfort zone of law enforcement. Um, and so this brings us finally, that's kind of the whole technical precursor to the talk, finally how has the government responded to this? And one way to think about this is what do you do if you get a indictment and you're wondering in the back of your mind, I saw that talk on malware in the dark net, could this be one of those? So I'm going to turn over to Colin for a slide to talk about when that happened to him. <clears throat> right. Now, uh, I am uh, something of a technophobe and by no means I'm a technically knowledgeable person. But, uh, and on top of that, one of the challenges uh, I think that most attorneys are going to face is that the government's use of malware and hacking and certainly uh, its use of the network investigative technique or NIT that uh, has been used in Operation Pacifier was uh, by no means uh, advertised. It was in fact concealed uh, by the Department of Justice uh, in its complaints and pleadings. Now I just want to back up for one second and, and talk about the fact that this is a TOR case to begin with uh, it is not a, a red flag in and of itself. TOR uh, probably has over 40 million users around the world. Uh, it's used by journalists, it's used uh, by activists in countries with uh, repressive regimes uh, to access the internet and communicate. A lot of people just use it, uh, even though it's a bit slower at times than the traditional internet, uh, because of its added privacy protection. So while the government is fond of referring to TOR as the dark web and portraying it uh, in its pleadings uh, when they are forced to reveal that we are dealing with a TOR case as some type of virtual den of criminality, uh, there really are tremendous uh, privacy interests at stake for the average citizen, uh, particularly as more and more people are becoming aware of the privacy intrusions that occur on a routine basis, whether by corporations or by hackers uh, other than the government, uh, with the regular internet. So uh, in our case, our first case uh, in the Western District of Washington, which just happened to be one of the very early ones filed, which is why we got out a little bit ahead uh, of some of the other uh, defense attorneys dealing with these issues, was simply by luck of the draw and force and circumstance, uh, we received a complaint uh, in a case that, uh, for the most part, looked like your typical child pornography possession case, uh, but there was uh, something that was uh, quite distinctive here, which is, uh, in the summary of investigation, there was a reference to the fact that because of the way the network uh, that our, our client was allegedly communicating on, routes communications, uh, traditional IP identification techniques are not viable. Well, of course, that, that simply raises the question of uh, if traditional techniques were not viable, what techniques were in fact used? Uh, now, uh, if you have one of these cases, and uh, you know there's, there are now additional red flags, uh, the activity that has resulted in charges in connection with Operation Pacifier uh, all occurred between February 19, 2015, and March 5 of 2015. Cases are still being charged across the country, um, according to the working group that my office is coordinating on this. I think there are probably about 250 cases. Um, that have been charged, uh, resolved, or still pending. You'll notice that there's nothing in the complaint about TOR, NITs, or anything of that nature. And as we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, one of the uh, most challenging aspects of the case uh, are the discovery battles, because uh, the uh, obfuscation and, and, in fact, downright misleading information that uh, prosecutors and the FBI uh, are, uh, have been putting out uh, about these cases um, it makes it very difficult to penetrate uh, what is actually going on uh, in the pacifier cases. Great. Um, so let's give you a little more terminology. So, so the government faced with um, kind of investigative challenges have begun to deploy, I think it's really fair to say viruses, right? There's a little bit of back and forth sometimes between public defenders and the government about whether it's accurate to call it malware or viruses or spyware. I'm giving you the academic seal of approval. That's absolutely what they're using. Uh, the only difference between this and the things that kind of cyber criminals are using is just intent. Um, and so that is the kind of technical accurate way to describe the bits of software the government has begun to deploy. And to be clear, usually with a search warrant. Um, but let me give you the kind of Orwellian 
de Department of Justice speak, um, as, as Colin has already said several times, they like to call these network investigative techniques or NITs, and that's kind of uh, taken hold. Um, sometimes, I think, in an attempt to just obfuscate, they'll call them computer and internal uh, protocol address verifiers or CI paths, uh, but you hopefully will never hear us use that ungainly acronym again in these two hours. Um, but again, it's really important to understand that what we're talking about is government created usually, or maybe they're government bought, pieces of computer viruses uh, that get transmitted by law enforcement to a target computer. Okay, let me give you an, a bit more terminology. I don't think you're going to see any of these in an indictment. Um, as Colin said, they're usually pretty cagey about when they use these. Um, but a term that's going to be really important for understanding some of the legal arguments in the second hour is the watering hole attack. So you've got this virus. Uh, you, let's say, have taken control of Bob's server um, on the darknet in hidden services. Um, and what you want to do is you want to keep that server running. Colin, we'll talk about some issues there. Um, and anytime someone tries to visit that service or anytime someone tries to do something at that service, um, you're going to not only give them the content they're expecting, but you're also going to try and um, infect their computer with a virus. This is known as a watering hole attack. Uh, and so the idea is you poison the watering hole and you have people come to it. Um, and uh, this is what we're really talking about in most of the recent child pornography cases, including pacifier. And just to make sure we're clear on terminology and lingo, pacifier is the same case as playpen. The website was called playpen. The investigation is called pacifier. Um, watering hole is uh, distinguished from phishing attacks. I'm sure uh, you've all read about phishing attacks in the news. A phishing attack is much more directed. It's a piece of email that you send to your target. Um, or some other thing that you direct to your target that says, hey, click on this link, and when you, they click on the link again, the attempt to infect the computer occurs. Okay. Malware doesn't have to occur over a network. Um, and in fact, in last year's high-profile Apple v. FBI controversy where the FBI sought access to one of the San Bernardino shooter's iPhones, um, it actually ended up never getting fully litigated because at the last minute FBI said, what do you know, someone has presented a piece of malware to us. And so that's a very different sort of investigative posture. It's a very different set of legal issues, one that we won't get too much into unless there's questions at the end. But there you have a standalone device in the possession of law enforcement, but because of encryption, they can't get into it and they need malware. Um, so to just kind of hammer home what was on the last slide, here's a very brief history. Um, I'm sure there are a few public cases that we don't know about, but I think the vast majority of what is known is in this timeline, and I'm not going to spend too much time on each one. In 2001, Nikki Scarfo, a suspected uh, mafioso, um, uh, the FBI got access to his computer, realized he was using disk encryption, and got a warrant a sneak and peek warrant to enter his home and install what we call a keylogger piece of software on the computer to try and catch Scarfo typing in the, the password. Um, probably the really, really first well-known piece of classic knit that we talk about today is Timberland High School in 2007, kind of in your neck of the woods. That's right, right Seattle area. In the Seattle area. Um, uh, the school was being bombarded with online bomb threats. They kept evacuating the school. It turned out whoever was sending the online threats was savvy enough not to use Tor. There was no Tor at the time, but instead had hacked several computers in Italy and was routing the messages through Italy. Um, and so what was known in 2007 um, <laughs> was that the FBI somehow convinced this person to click on a link in email or social media, I forget which one it was, um, which infected the person's computer and revealed that person's IP address. So this is a really important reminder for the rest of this talk that although we will focus so much on Tor, malware can and will be used in non-Tor cases as well, particularly when there's some sort of misdirection being used to hide identity. Okay. Um, one other side note that might be of interest to uh, many of you is that we learned much, much later, like seven years later, that the way they tricked the Timberland High School bomb threat maker to click on the link was they impersonated the Associated Press and the Seattle Times. 
uh, and they kind of played on the person's ego and said, hey, here's a story I'm writing about you. Click on this link to see if I got the details right. That's how they infected the person's computer. So it raised all sorts of First Amendment and other issues as well. Um, Okay, and it turned out, by the way, that it was a student at the high school who had, who had sent the threat, and there really was no other way that they probably could have gotten that case but for the piece of malware, and again, they had a warrant. Torpedo, Freedom Hosting, and Pacifier are all Tor Hidden Services cases. And in every one of these cases, I mean, what's really fascinating about every one of these cases is given the investigative uh, roadblocks I was describing earlier, all three of these cases kind of started with dumb luck, uh, where for whatever reason the person who ran the server let leak on the internet their IP address. Um, and I think in more than one of these cases, it was them before they became a big deal asking around on message boards, like, hey, here's my IP address, look at my server, how does this look? Um, but in all three cases, because of the dumb luck, law enforcement managed to take down a server uh, then get permission from the court to put the server back up, but this time deploying malware in a watering hole sort of attack. Okay, so that's again about all we know. But don't be uh, don't be fooled by the limited number of entries on this slide, as we've discussed. Not only pacifier, but freedom hosting, and we think torpedo involved massive numbers of probably infected computers. And in the case of pacifier, we know um, some sense of how many hundreds of computers were infected. Okay. Um, the last, this is the very last deep technical slide of our entire presentation, but I think it actually bears um, a little bit of study because the taxonomy you see on the screen breaks up a knit into four components, um, and it turns out, I think, embedded in every line on this slide are different legal issues that might come up. Um, so let me just spend an appropriate amount of time on each line here. Uh, line A, so, so you can think of your knit, and this is just software, but you can think of your knit as having four pieces. Piece one is really the, um, the kind of piece that we call the generator. Um, and again, maybe we'll get later into why a generator is so important and the legal issues. But the idea is it kind of tailor makes a generic piece of malware for an individual target. So on Pacifier, there was a generator that said for every user that we're going to try and infect, give it its own unique little number that we can use later when we get to court and we're trying to prove that this person's computer was the computer that uh, we targeted. Okay, so that one's a little bit esoteric. The second line is vital to everything we're discussing. The reason malware works, not only in the law enforcement contest test, but uh, just in general life, is because software is full of bugs. Your operating system is full of bugs. Your networking software is full of bugs. It's always full of bugs. Um, in the kind of cybersecurity world we're inhabiting in this topic, we call these bugs vulnerab vulnerabilities. Um, and there is a race to find the next great vulnerability. Um, there are people all around the world who make a lot of money hunting for these vulnerabilities. Um, and the government, the U.S. government, is an avid purchaser of these vulnerabilities. They stockpile them. And at the very end, we'll talk a little bit about potential legal issues creeping in there. But the idea is once you know that a computer has a particular vulnerability, the reason that's important is because you can craft a piece of software to generate what we call an exploit to take advantage of that vulnerability. Um, so the exploit is, in many ways, the piece of this long list of things that makes the software successfully integrate itself into a running system. Okay, uh, No vulnerability, you have no exploit. They're, they go hand in hand. Um, so in the case of Playpen, <laughs> what we've learned, and Colin will go into gory detail about uh, how we learned some of this, is that it probably was a pre-existing vulnerability in the Firefox browser that was bundled with Tor uh, that got exploited by whatever piece of malware we're talking about. Okay. But the reason there are two more lines to discuss, and I'll go a little more quickly through these, is getting onto the computer is one thing. Convincing the computer to run your code is the biggest battle. But you usually want to do that for a reason, and we refer to this in cybersecurity as the payload of the piece of malware. So the idea is, okay, I've cracked open the window, uh, but what do I want to do inside the house? That's kind of the difference between exploit and payload. Um, and in a lot of these cases, what the payload is, is root around on that computer 
and find something that will help me figure out whose computer this belongs to. Uh, it might be their IP address. Computers know their own IP addresses. It might be another unique identifier called a MAC address. Uh, it might be what, what's the name of this person's computer. Um, but I'm trying to kind of prejudge and set up the Fourth Amendment conversation to be had. The idea is we are searching through that computer uh, to find some piece of information that will help me identify this person. And then the last step is, well, that's great. It's good that the NIT can find that critical piece of information, but they have to phone home to what we call the server component. Um, and so literally when the FBI does this, they create a server somewhere uh, at FBI headquarters or out at Quantico uh, that is programmed to listen for NITs all around the globe phoning home. And when those NITs phone home, they say, here's the IP address or here's the MAC address that we discovered, um, and they register with that server component. Did I omit anything there that you want to highlight? No, no, I think that sums it up really well. And what I just want to uh, highlight here before we go on to the next section, and this will be something we touch on throughout, is that uh, while Paul has given a very accurate summary of why this is called a, a technique, uh, these, these components work in conjunction. They interact. They all need to be working accurately and reliability for uh, any of the evidence or data that's collected to have evidentiary value. Uh, but the government is not going to agree on what constitutes a NIT and uh, will play a great deal of gamesmanship uh, in terms of responding to discovery demand. So, for example, uh, in our litigation in Western Washington, uh, once we realized that this was a tour case, uh, involving some sort of malware, uh, we asked uh, for the NIT code. Uh, the government originally resisted that. It then uh, ostensibly agreed to give it to us, uh, but what we got was really just a portion uh, of the payload. Uh, and then we ended up in a prolonged discovery battle about whether the other components were required, whether they were included in our discovery demands. Uh, and uh, all of these components are critical. We have uh, declarations available uh, through the working group uh, from various experts who can explain why, and I won't go into all the details. Uh, but the government, uh, in terms of uh, current pacifier cases, is still throwing out these red herrings in response to the discovery demands being made by defenders around the country for the NIT components, uh, giving them something called the data stream, giving them uh, pieces of the payload, uh, even though everybody knows the cat is out of the bag and the judges who have uh, ruled on these issues uh, have found that the, all the components are material. Uh, so just another uh, word to the wise about some of the uh, complications and misinformation you may be confronting. So let me interrupt you real quick mm -hmm. just to set the table because this is probably where we're going to kind of have a big transition in the talk. Uh, so you have this indictment. It's got this mystery sentence like the one uh, Colin highlighted for you. You've got a sense now that the only reason your client was discovered was through the use of malware, or you at least suspect that. Um, and so that's all we're going to say about how do you spot malware in your case. Um, and that's a huge, deep, and frankly, uh, hard to summarize topic that we probably could say a lot more about. Uh, but the rest of the talk now presupposes that you at least have an inkling that malware was used. What do you do at every stage of litigation going forward uh, to try and challenge it? Okay. Thank you. So, all right, let's uh, just to give you a little bit more background about uh, Pacifier and the Playpen website, because we're now going to kind of talk about a lot of the issues, Fourth Amendment issues, discovery issues, in connection with the uh, factual issues that came up in Pacifier. So, um, what went on in Operation Pacifier is that late uh, in 2014, a foreign law enforcement agency uh, uh, picked up on the Playpen website, which was being run out uh, basically out of a guy's bedroom in Florida uh, because of misconfiguration with the hidden server connection. So uh, the, there actually were a bunch of amateurs who set up this site, uh, but uh, and they didn't they didn't connect uh, they didn't anonymize themselves uh, properly at all stages through the Tor network. Uh, the FBI then tracks uh, the uh, server to a location in Florida and seizes the server, arrests the uh, main administrator, and then uh, takes uh, the server to uh, Guantico, Virginia, uh, sets it up, and keeps Playpen operating uh, as a fully functional operation child pornography site. 
And uh, the government has, in fact, admitted uh, in various pleadings uh, under pressure that during the time period that the FBI was actively operating uh, Playpen, it became the world's largest distributor of child pornography on the Internet. Uh, so the FBI now has the curious distinction of being one of the major child pornography kingpins in connection uh, with this operation. And I'll talk very uh, shortly about why that is outrageous uh, beyond the obvious uh, reasons that may occur to you because, in fact, the FBI had had alternatives in terms of uh, advancing its investigation using the net that did not require it uh, to become uh, such a massive distributor of pornography. In any event, uh, just shortly after the, uh, the site was seized in Florida, the uh, government, the FBI, applied uh, for an NIT warrant, a single warrant in the Eastern District of Virginia that uh, ostensibly authorized it to deploy the NIT uh, against anybody who connected uh, to the Playpen website. Uh, and then from there, uh, once the IP address and some other data was collected and identified, then uh, the typical secondary follow-on warrant, the local warrants, uh, would be developed uh, using the IP address information uh, and physical address information collected from the uh, Internet service provider. Uh, and uh, there will be actually some issues we'll touch on briefly, some Frank's issues in connection with those. Uh, but in any event, uh, once we had a little bit of a handle on uh, what we were dealing with, uh, what ultimately evolved was really kind of a broadly uh, forefronted uh, attack on the government's cases. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the outrageous governmental uh, conduct issues. Uh, it is all but impossible uh, to get an indictment dismissed on the basis of outrageous governmental conduct. In fact, we got very good factual findings from our judge uh, in Tacoma, Washington in connection with this issue. Uh, but obviously the law is against you and basically uh, unless your client has uh, been tortured uh, in order to extract a confession or something that is as direct and extreme as that, it's hard to to win. Uh, but it is important in terms of dealing with good faith issues, which is where a lot of the cases are turning at this point. We're also going to talk about some of the jurisdictional Rule 41 and Federal Magistrate Act issues. Uh, that was the second element of our attack. Uh, there are a host of probable cause, anticipated Warren and Franks issues, so there was a full-fledged Fourth Amendment attack as well. And then, uh, interestingly enough, and, and so far, uh, our cases in Western Washington have been uh, the only ones to prevail on this issue, um, partly because, unfortunately, I'm not seeing the issue quite as aggressively developed in other jurisdictions, so it's out there and I'm happy uh, to assist you with it, also in part because we got uh, a, a, a sympathetic judge. Uh, but ultimately where we prevailed was with the discovery and due process issues in terms of our client's ability or rather inability uh, to uh, fully and fairly litigate the Fourth Amendment issues and, and more importantly develop defenses at trial uh, because of the government's withholding uh, of information. So let me just touch briefly on the outrageous conduct issues uh, and a conservative estimate which the government has not disputed uh, in response to our pleadings is that during the time that the uh, that playpen was under the control of the FBI distributed at least at least a million images uh, and videos of uh, uh, child abuse uh, and uh, I am certainly uh, sympathetic and respectful of all the reasons why law enforcement needs to go after uh, these hidden services and uh, investigate child pornography uh, with advanced technology, uh, but there was a lot of needless uh, uh, misconduct in connection uh, with this case, uh, which you know was helpful in ways to our defense, but was really unfortunate to see. Uh, the uh, FBI, for example, uh, actually improved the accessibility and speed of the playpen site while it was uh, operating it. Uh, it took no efforts whatsoever to limit access to or the redistribution, redistribution of child pornography that was posted and being uploaded onto the site, uh, even though there are various ways uh, which you can at least limit or slow down the redistribution through, and I won't go into detail, spoofing, uh, dead-ed links, using child erotica or virtual pornography, methods that would maintain the credibility of the site in terms of people visiting it, 
uh, and uh, allow you to use the size of watering hole without actively distributing child pornography. Uh, no effort whatsoever was made uh, to do that while the FBI had control of this site. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, just to give you one very clear example of how troubling this is, uh, the FBI uh, maintained a forum on Playpen called How To, uh, which was basically uh, an advice blog or chat room for uh, how to groom victims and avoid uh, law enforcement detection. Uh, the FBI could very easily have at least shut down that forum, claimed technical difficulties, uh, any number of ways of uh, limiting access to that kind of information, uh, but the FBI um, uh, actually actively promoted the access and uh, to that site. Visitation went from approximately 11,000 per week to 50,000 per week uh, at the site while the FBI was controlling it uh, through, I guess, some um, uh, uh, geeks at uh, the FBI who thought uh, they may as well put uh, their skills to work in terms of improving uh, the site. Uh, there's really no credible dispute that what the FBI did uh, is illegal. There is no law enforcement exception for the distribution of child pornography. In fact, um, 18 U.S.C. Section 3509M specifically prohibits the uh, government from redistributing uh, child pornography uh, that is collected or obtained in the course of an investigation. And in fact, many defense counsel have run into the argument Ironically, we're even seeing it in connection with playpen cases where, uh, for example, if the defense counsel wants an independent expert to do an analysis of a copy of the hard drive, uh, there's often a lot of resistance because the government will claim, well, we can't give you the hard drive or a marriage or a copy of it because there's child pornography on it and we would be guilty of distribution. Uh, that message seems to have been lost uh, on the government in connection with uh, Pacifier. Uh, and it, just from an ethical standpoint, it's troubling. If you go to the Department of Justice's website, uh, you will see in connection with the child exploitation and uh, uh, obscenity section, they have materials there talking about how every time uh, an image of child pornography is viewed or redistributed, the child that is depicted is re-victimized. Uh, and certainly we see that in a lot of our sentencing memoranda and in terms of restitution claims. Uh, whether or not you agree uh, entirely with uh, that uh, concept of the extent of the victimization, uh, there certainly can be no dispute that given its pronouncements uh, in support of the victims, uh, what the FBI did here is uh, extremely troubling. And this isn't the first time they've done it. Uh, United States versus Sherman is an older case out of the Seventh Circuit, uh, really involved just VHS cassettes, uh, just shows how far technology has come and what an antique it is. But basically what the government did there uh, was uh, to uh, send uh, some child pornography videos uh, to the target and then uh, obtain an anticipatory warrant, uh, which they took a few days to execute, uh, to uh, seize uh, those images and execute a search. Uh, the, second sur the Seventh Circuit, sua sponte, this issue was not even raised uh, by the defendant, uh, essentially lambasted the government for uh, their investigatory methods and clearly gave them a warning uh, about disseminating child pornography in the course of an investigation and that they need to use alternative methods. Uh, again, that lesson, that warning seems to have been lost uh, on the government. And uh, this may be hard to see, but what we ultimately got access to, again, through protracted discovery litigation, uh, was some of the messages uh, uh, the administrator postings that were on playpen uh, while the FBI operating it. This, this particular post uh, was posted by an FBI agent, uh, and it talks about how the file hosting features have been improved, uh, which of course is uh, nothing more than aiding and abetting uh, the distribution of child pornography. Uh, certainly the site was not needed, uh, did not need improvements. Uh, so ultimately, uh, we did get uh, a series of findings uh, in one of our cases in Western Washington. Uh, the judge noted that uh, the government ignored the statute forbidding redistribution of child pornography. Uh, DOJ's own internal guidelines for internet uh, investigations uh, emphasizes, in fact, that these type of investigations are not like typical buy and bust operations or drug prosecutions because uh, every effort in those type of cases is made to simply uh, hand over or use the drugs as bait or do a limited transaction. And then, of course, every effort is made to uh, get the uh, contraband back and, and back into an evidence room. Uh, that's impossible uh, with distributing images uh, on the internet and 
DOJ's internal guidelines recognizes that uh, and uh, puts at least a, uh, a lot of brakes uh, on uh, undercover Internet investigations if, if not absolutely forbidding them, which were simply ignored in connection with this case. Uh, the, the court went on to talk about how uh, the uh, government improved uh, website A's playpen's uh, functionality, uh, made no effort uh, to uh, notify the victims, in fact, used the victims as bait in the uh, judge's terms. Uh, meanwhile, of course, the government is making restitution claims on connection with some of these playpen cases, and attorneys are, uh, of course, emphasizing the uh, hypocrisy of that. But in any event, um, all that said, we did not get suppression for the reasons that I outlined. There there was really no argument that our clients' uh, due process rights have been directly violated in connection with this outrageous conduct. Uh, but uh, we think, uh, as, a one, as our last remaining case with one count uh, remaining goes up on appeal in the Ninth Circuit, we do think that these fines are going to be important uh, in terms of the good faith arguments that we're seeing uh, a lot of courts are reverting to in terms of upholding uh, these searches, uh, even in the face of all the jurisdictional and Rule 41 violations that Paul yeah, is going and, to and talk about. Was, and let me add one more thing to that, which is, um, you know, you're going to encounter this in future malware cases, not just child pornography cases. Uh, it goes back to that slide about how the hidden services work. Whenever DOJ gets lucky through dumb luck and figures out where one of these servers are, they immediately face this decision, which is, I can do the interdiction now, take this content offline, but I could also let it run for days or weeks and try and find some of the people who are users of the site. Um, and so again, this isn't just a playpen issue, and I don't think it's uh, just a child pornography issue. You're likely to see the government face this issue every single time it takes down a hidden services server. Okay. Um, so let's tee up Rule 41. We're going to spend not too much time, actually, on the way Rule 41 used to be, because as you'll see, the punchline is the federal rules have now been changed uh, to make a lot of these issues go away. But one of the kind of motions that um, many of the public defenders around the country brought were motions about the magistrate judges typically, or in some cases, district court judges. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. We're just talking about a single warrant, right? In this case, right. In this case, um, exceeding their authorization under Rule 41 of the federal rules of criminal procedure. Um, specifically, what kind of law professors think of as the venue provisions in 41B. Um, and so the idea is the kind of extent of the power of the magistrate judge extends only as far as the boundaries of that particular district in which they are a magistrate judge. Um, and there are kind of several subsections to be that give you permission in certain slightly out of the ordinary situations to sign warrants to search or seize uh, 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 things that are outside of your district. Okay, so here, again, let's go through these really quickly. Um, but the bottom line is in Playpen and in other cases, the uh, challenge has been brought. It's a two-step challenge. One is you signed a warrant that Rule 41 that did not give you the authority to sign. Number two, that falls within the kind of Fourth Amendment protections. This isn't just part of the supervisory power or statutory power of the courts <laughs> um, and so should lead to constitutional suppression. Um, so B1 is search for and seize a person or property located win within the district. And Colin, I'll ask you to kind of give me some color commentary on how this played out in play, Ben. I think the theory here, and this is a little bit of fast and loose when it comes to other contradictory arguments DOJ might make, uh, the idea here is they went to a judge in the Eastern District of Virginia. Quantico is in the Eastern District of Virginia. Uh, and so that kind of piece of software originated in the Eastern District of Virginia. Now, I, do I have that right? Is that yes. Okay? The flaw with that, of course, is the kind of initial transmission of the malware, the NIT, maybe at some point started in, the, in Quantico, but then it literally traveled the globe uh, by virtue of Tor Hidden Services um, and then did a lot of things on a computer in a completely different district. Uh, and if you had gone to that magistrate judge and said, can you sign a warrant to search a computer in Tacoma, Washington, I think the judge properly would have said, well, no, B1 doesn't give me that authority. Um, and so DOJ, again, had to, at least for purposes of Rule 41, say it all happened in Quantico uh, to try and fit within B1. And let me just add that yeah. you know that, that a lot of the early litigation surrounded this this uh, issue about where the search occurred. Now it was fairly clear 
uh, I think to us and to all the experts and, and even on the basis of the facts in terms of the data that was extracted uh, that the searches occurred on the computers wherever they were loca located that the, the net infected but uh, there was certainly a lot of uh, tap dancing and, and, and interesting theories put out uh, by DOJ at least early on we've gotten over that threshold in almost all the cases uh, to try and suggest well you know it's kind of like computers connecting and the information doesn't really get seized until it's back to the server component um, so what is now kind of an accepted concept of where these search were located was in fact a, at one point a hotly litigated issues although I don't think the government had a lot of merit uh, behind its arguments yeah and, and so B2 is uh, again superficially sounds like maybe it describes kind of what's happening in playpen but I think the better reading is this is not what uh, the rules intended um, so it's uh, for property or person that's within the district when the warrant is issued, but then might move outside the district. So this is a car or something uh, that's that's movable. Uh, let's do the other ones really quickly could, because, as I said, these have now been amended. Uh, B three is about terrorism cases, so it would not apply, uh, you know, in the cases we're talking about here. Uh, B four is about tracking devices within the district, and I think this also got a lot of government briefing and attention, the Justice Department was really enamored of the idea that tracking de devices, which kind of traditionally we think of them as uh, uh, United States v. Jones style GPS trackers on the undercarriage of a car, um, but the idea is, you know, the rules say a lot about tracking devices. These are kind of metaphorically or analogically tracking devices for the internet. Um, and again, I think some judges have found that mildly appealing, but it hasn't gotten a, a few. A few have bitten off on it, but uh, it just doesn't fit the plain language of the rule. And then B5, of course, is, is totally uh, in a posit to the cases we're talking about, speaking as it does about U.S. territories and diplomatic missions. All right, so let, let me, I'll give you a brief update on the pacifier case status, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the ins and outs of the various opinion, opinions. Uh, I just want to note that uh, the government, again, in relation to these good faith arguments that's, uh, that are taking hold, uh, the government was fully aware that Rule 41 did not allow for the type of NIT uh, searches that they executed in playpen. And there are several reasons we know that. First of all, if you look at DOJ's own search and seizure materials, uh, they are very clear about the fact fact that uh, you cannot do a kind of global malware search the type that was executed here without running afoul of the rule. Uh, there was a decision uh, uh, by a magistrate judge in Texas uh, called In Re Warrant of Target Computer. I'm going to give you this citation because it's a nice primer on Rule 41, 980 F sub second 753. This was in 2013. It's the only published opinion on an NIT warrant application, and it walked through all the Rule 41 provisions and made it very clear uh, that there there was no authorization under the rule uh, for the type of search that was executed in playpen. Uh, the government was acutely aware of that opinion because it, that decision was one of the reasons they started seeking an amendment to Rule 41. So uh, with the notion that the government was acting in good faith or that there are colorable legal arguments in support of jurisdiction uh, really don't stand up when you look at some of the background and internal uh, materials uh, related to uh, these type of internet searches. Now, now, just in terms of uh, the case statuses, uh, most of the courts that have looked at the cases so far have uh, found that Rule 41 was violated uh, or that the uh, or variations on that theme in terms of the warrant being void at the outset, uh, but have bitten off on the good faith exception. Uh, part of what's of concern to me about that is, again, not uh, there hasn't been a lot of development in some of these cases in terms of the outrageous misconduct issues, in terms of the history of the Rule 41 amendments. Um, a lot of the judges in issuing their opinions are talking about how well, you know, how is an FBI agent supposed to know what Rule 41 really stands for? Well, this, this warrant was vetted at the highest levels of the Department of Justice and FBI, so that argument doesn't really stand up if the facts are properly developed. Uh, but in any event, uh, five cases uh, out of uh, probably 80 or so that have been decided, only five of them have reached um, uh, suppression uh, based on the Rule 41. Uh, two of them are, uh, three of them are on appeal. Two were recently reversed in terms of suppression orders, again relying on the good faith exception. Uh, and then we have the discovery exclusion cases, which are my two cases out of the Western District of Washington. The government dismissed its appeal of the exclusion order in the first case. We won't have a decision there. The second case, United States versus Tippin, and their Tippins are materials related to both cases uh, that have been provided to you. Uh, the receipt and transportation count 
counts were dismissed based on the discovery issues, which I'll get to. Uh, there is one possession count to which my client was given a six-month sentence and a stay pending appeal. Uh, that is going up, and we're hoping, we're very much hoping, the Ninth Circuit is going to see all these issues uh, somewhat differently. Uh, I want to skip over most of the rest. Uh, U.S. versus Levin, this is a case that's on appeal in the Second Circuit. Uh, a good primer uh, on uh, why there was no good faith, uh, because uh, the court there was satisfied that a veteran FBI agent, let alone all the attorneys involved in this case, uh, should know that this was not uh, a permissible warrant under Rule 41, and actually developed a theory that was first uh, articulated by now Supreme Court Judge Gorsuch when he was on the Tenth Circuit in a Concurrence on the notion of a warrant being void ab initio for jurisdictional reasons. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what the Second Circuit does with Levin. Uh, and now, uh, a lot of this, as we indicated, may a little be a little more historical because of the changes to Rule 41, which uh, Paul will now summarize. And as, as Colin suggested, this uh, kind of was spurred in part by this. Uh, Magistrate judge opinion out of Texas and other things, and the playpen case began to be part of the conversation as well. Um, but there were proposals from the Justice Department through the kind of somewhat arcane ways the federal rules get uh, uh, amended to kind of account for the growing use of things like TOR and TOR hidden services. Um, and so long story short, although there was a little bit of public outcry and action to try and roll back these changes, they are now, as of December of last year, uh, the law of the land. Um, and in particular, there's now a new section B6. So as the slide indicates, B1 through B5 are unchanged. And B6 has two provisions. The second one is about botnet takedowns, a really interesting topic, but not the topic for this talk. But A is where you should kind of focus your attention. Um, a judge is now allowed to sign a warrant to search for a property that might be located outside. And I have to say, in the ellipses there, I did you a disservice. Uh, the missing language says to use remote access to search electronic storage media and to seize or copy electronically stored information. So this is only for kind of online investigations. Uh, but the operative language is the district where the media or information is located has been concealed through technological means, right? And so I can think of kind of ways that you could try and litigate around that language. Um, but as you kind of unroll the way this debate happened and you look at the intent of the rules committees, um, it seems pretty clear that what they were thinking about were cases like Playpen and cases involving kind of hidden services. And so this seems to foreclose, at least from my point of view, aggressive Rule 41B venue sorts of objections. This is my moment to highlight one of the materials that uh, we put um, uh, with the talk, which is an article by Jonathan Mayer. It's in draft form, but will come out at some point in the Yale Law Journal. Uh, I think it's called Government Hacking. Part three of that article is actually a wonderful primer on kind of seven legal issues, including many of the ones we're discussing here that arise from the government's use of malware. And so at the very bottom of this slide, I talk about two things that uh, Professor Mayer tees up really nicely. Uh, one is, remember that Rule 41 also has a 14-day for execution rule. Uh, and it turns out the playpen warrant, for example, said, you have 10 days to kind of deploy this, uh, but as soon as it's deployed, you have up to 30 days to listen for the uh, NITs phoning home. And so a question is, is that proper within the 14-day rule of Rule 41? Uh, that's a big issue I don't think has been litigated a ton. The second one is, and I'm not even sure this can come up in a motion to suppress, but I'm going to flag it for you and refer you to Mayer's article. Um, there's an idea here that, you know, by the time people get indicted, uh, and presented with criminal charges, they know that the NIT was installed on their computer. Uh, but there's no doubt hundreds or thousands or maybe tens of thousands of computers in Playpen alone that were infected and never had any notice whatsoever. Um, and so there might be an argument that this is not within the notice requirements of Rule 41, where in a traditional case you leave the warrant behind even if the you know, property owner isn't present. They took no steps to do that in Playpen. They could have, right? There's some fanciful speculation that they could have had the virus send you a little pop-up that said, surprise, the FBI has put software on your computer. Um, but for obvious reasons, the FBI didn't want to do that and didn't do that. And maybe there's some sort of, I don't know, collective, you know, Bivens class action or something that we could bring against that. But I doubt that's going to come up in a suppression context. Okay. Um, that's Rule 41. Right? And there's obviously an overlap with the Fourth Amendment and with motions to suppress, but let's roll up our sleeves and get into the kind of deep Fourth Amendment questions. This is an endless well that we could go on for hours and hours, so we're going to have to um, skip some of the details. Um, so once again, Colin nicely kind of 
talked about characterized the type of warrant we're talking about in the playpen case. This was signed once by a single magistrate judge uh, that then led to the installation and search of thousands and thousands of computers around the world. And by the way, we know it's around the world because there has been reporting about referrals that have been made in Greece and in the United Kingdom uh, where the FBI has basically tied up with a bow IP addresses going back to uh, targets in those countries, and a lot of those have uh, led to foreign prosecution. Although, let me add, it, it's not at all clear that the magistrate who signed the Eastern District NIT warrant knew that this was a global warrant. Uh, it's a 41-page warrant application on its face. Uh, it indicates that it is searching for persons or property located within the Eastern District of Virginia, squarely within Rule 41. The only reference to it being global warrant appears on page 38 of the 41-page mm -hmm. warrant application, and it consists of two words, which is that the NIT will be deployed on target computers wherever located. Uh, whether or not that is sufficient to alert a magistrate judge who's presented with a warrant lim on its face limited to her own jurisdiction, uh, that this is in fact a global warrant, you know, is up for debate. We have not heard from the judge. Uh, but again, another another attempt by the FBI to bury the lead. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so let's say a few words about particularity and probable cause. And again, there are lots of different ways you can approach this. Um, and those two kind of issues intertwine with one another. Um, and when I teach particularity, and maybe this is only something a law professor would love, uh, um, what I tell my students is the more you can make the government conduct akin to a general warrant, the more likely you're going to get the uh, judge interested in, in your particularity objection. Uh, so the idea is a single piece of paper that ends up targeting this many people um, cannot be particular and is the closest thing in modern history we've ever heard of that's akin to the general warrants that the framers were concerned about, right? Now, it's a little bit of a kind of hand-waving argument because we have a lot of case law in particularity, uh, and some of it tends to think of particularity in a far more narrow sense. Um, and so it's not completely clear that this is going to be uh, an ultimate winner in this case or in other cases. A lot of this, though, as I said, is bound up with probable cause, so let's kind of put that on the table here. Uh, let me just like tee up the probable cause issue, but then you're much more uh, entrenched in the way this is played out. Um, I think probable cause in the playpen case in particular is tied so closely to the nature of the child pornography laws and how kind of exceptional they are uh, in the criminal code. Um, and so the idea was this wasn't a general pornography site. This wasn't a general kind of Silk Road style drug purchasing site. Um, this was, at least to believe the J Department of Justice, a site for the sole purpose of the distribution of child pornography. Um, and so that, I think, feeds into the probable cause argument that was made at the time the warrant was signed and that lots of judges have talked about since then. Right. Correct. Uh, and, uh, you know, clearly when you're dealing with child pornography cases, you're, there, there are certain just uh, realistic headwinds that you're dealing with by nature of the offense. I think of 100,000 uh, computers have been targeted that belong to uh, bankers or hedge fund managers. Uh, the outcome in some of these cases, frankly, might have been different. Uh, but that's just my personal uh, aside about uh, trying to uh, litigate and educate the judges uh, about the larger Fourth Amendment and privacy issues that may be embedded in cases which obviously have can have very disturbing facts. Uh, with the, uh, the playpen case, uh uh, obviously, in terms of having 100,000 visitors just during the time that the FBI was uh, was writing uh, was operating the site, uh, it is uh, easy to at least frame a general warrant argument. There was no particularized information about any of those visitors. Uh, the uh, fact that it was in fact a global warrant. In addition, this was really an anticipatory warrant. Uh, the the Eastern District warrant, the NIT warrant, authorized the government to uh, deploy the malware at the moment of signing on the home page. Another reason why the government, the FBI, did not really have to keep all of this hideous content available because uh, by the time anybody could access actually entered the site, uh, the malware uh, had already been deployed to their computer. Uh, obviously, a lot of people who might just be looking at the site uh, realized what the content really is and backed out uh, because they really did not want to be looking or collecting at child pornography. Uh, they were already implicated in these searches, so there wasn't a lot in terms of distinguishing uh, casual or unknowing visitors uh, from uh, people who were actively seeking out child pornography. 
And that in particular became an issue because of the way that the uh, government um, maintained the uh, Playpen website. Uh, this is the way that the Playpen uh, homepage appeared at the time that the FBI was uh, operating the site. And in fact, uh, this is how uh, it appeared at the time that the FBI seized the website. Uh, as you can see, um, apart from what looks like a, a young but fully closed uh, girl in the upper left-hand corner whose image is actually a lot less provocative than uh, what I've seen in connection with teen beauty contests or, or teen magazines, uh, there's really nothing on here to indicate that it's a child pornography site. In fact, uh, it looks at most maybe like some sort of chat room or fetish site. Uh, certainly no different from a lot of sites that offer legal content. Yet, uh, simply by landing on this site and starting to enter your login information, you were potentially subject to a highly intrusive malware uh, search. So let's, let's dwell on that. I mean, I think this is such a critical and interesting and honestly confusing part of this case, right? So um, the, the defense counsel have lodged motions about probable cause have focused a lot on the fact that the warrant itself said, we want you to give really broad authority to infect computers all over the globe. Um, and we want that authority for anyone who has sign-in information for this website, as I understand it. Or as they're signing in. Or because as at the point, you may in. be a new visitor and not yeah. know what the content is, but yeah. as you're generating your made-up name and, and, and asking for a password, uh, the malware is already hitting it. And again, this goes to what I was saying earlier about the kind of intrinsic nature of the crime that we're talking about. Right, one of the few crimes in the criminal code where the broad First Amendment exception, we can criminalize this behavior. The mere possession of this information, much less the distribution, uh, is a crime. Right, These are all crimes. Um, and so the government could have structured this warrant differently. It could have said, uh, we are going to um, try and infect computers after they've completed the crime of downloading kind of a known piece of child pornography. Um, they could have structured this in lots of different ways, but as I understand, one of the main complaints is we're going to do it as early as possible within the kind of broadest scope we have, which I think does give them some weakness when it comes to the probable cause argument. The second thing that I think you alluded to, but let's put it on the table, is they attach to the warrant, as I understand it, an older picture, picture of the homepage. Um, that maybe was a lot more lascivious and maybe the kind of argument that just by merely visiting this website you exhibited kind of the requisite at least probable cause of criminal uh, conduct, um, but by the time they actually started using it, they had changed that website, which that, is just a strange turn of events, right? It, it, it's strange. It's, it's well, I, I think outrageous might be the word of the day. What happened was that in the Eastern District of Virginia, the warrant application there um, described the old Playpen homepage, the one exist that was in existence uh, prior to the time that the FBI took it over. Uh, the FBI didn't change the homepage. This is what the homepage looked at, uh, like at the time that they uh, seized the site in Florida. But what they presented to the magistrate judge in, in Virginia was uh, an old, a description of an older version of the site that had explicit child pornography on the homepage. Uh, so the connection there that, well, anybody who gets to the site and is signing in uh, clearly knows what they're getting because there's actual child pornography on the homepage. Uh, this obviously generated some serious Franks issues. Um, uh, you know, a, a difficult aspect of getting to the bottom of this was that when we started getting discovery, we were given a copy of, with redactions, of the original homepage with child pornography on it. Um, and it was only uh, after some investigation investigation that we realized that the home page had changed by the time the warrant was issued and that it had not been disclosed uh, to the magistrate judge in Virginia, uh, eventually received this copy. Uh, and along with it, some very interesting email correspondence between the lead case agent and some other case agents about how we had clued into this. Uh, so it seemed that there was uh, at least a suggestion of a calculated effort to keep from uh, the defense uh, the actual appearance of the site at the time uh, that the relevant time, which was when the warrant application was submitted. All right. Um, I'm going to skip over this uh, because uh, we've talked already a little bit. This is a case uh, out of Oklahoma that the government decided not to appeal, dealing with some of the preliminary issues. Uh, clearly, a search occurred when there was a malware search. We've talked about that. Um, there's been an argument that the government made that there's no expectation of privacy in an IP address, so therefore no Fourth Amendment issue. Uh, there are two flaws with that. One, factually, the uh, NIT seized more than an IP address, something 
the Paul reference, including that include a MAC address. A MAC address is unique to a computer. It's not typically shared with third parties like your internet service provider. It's clearly something that was extracted uh, solely from the computer and could not be uh, gotten from a third uh, party. Uh, and uh, for those reasons, uh, you know, the expectation of privacy exists in the data that was seen. It's also a question of the location of the search. Uh, most of these computers were located in people's homes. Uh, so the Supreme Court has made very clear uh, in, in various places, including the Jones case, the GPS tracking case from 2012, uh, that it's not necessarily the type of information that's seized in the course of a search or whether it's available or has been shared with third parties that is dispositive of uh, a privacy interest or a Fourth Amendment claim. Uh, it also has to do with the location of the search itself. And once it's established that these malware searches in, uh, occurred in, in private computers, uh, not shared with third parties, typically in people's homes, uh, your Fourth Amendment standing, your Fourth Amendment uh, privacy issue is clearly established uh, by that fact, regardless of the type of information that may be, uh, may be collected. Okay. So, uh, so before we leave that, just because yeah, okay. I, I need to get on the soapbox here, right? Oh, please I, do. <laughs> <laughs> so to me, this is uh, the single most puzzling thing that I've seen in the playpen cases, not Arterbury. Arterbury is the case that gets this right. But there are a number of judicial opinions, not many, but a few, that have ruled otherwise and that have said, well, what is the nature of the thing that they wanted? They wanted IP addresses. And what are IP addresses? IP addresses are these things that our computers typically kind of promiscuously share with uh, everyone on the internet, right? Um, and there actually is Ninth Circuit case law that says when the government is in a kind of public part of the internet uh, and they're watching IP addresses flow by, there may not be a reasonable expectation of privacy. I personally think that case Forrester was really wrongly decided, but whatever, we can kind of establish that as the background principle of law. So there are lots of analogies I've deployed to discuss what a lot of people think is the kind of fatal, uh, and I'm a law professor, I don't litigate in front of these judges, so let me say like silly mistake that a few of the other judges have made. Here's one analogy. Um, what Does the government need a warrant to have a picture of you, right? A picture of your face. Well, you can't answer that question because if the question is, do they need a warrant to take a picture of you on the street? The answer is probably not. But if there's a picture of you sitting in your desk drawer in your office, in your home, and they want to kick down the door, open the drawer, and take that picture of you, absolutely they need a warrant to get that. And the fact that it is a piece of information that have obtained in a totally different circumstance uh, would have necessitated a warrant is completely irrelevant, and it's a fundamental mistake. The last thing I'll say, because it's just there's only so many angry words I can say about this in the webinar format, uh, both the Jonathan Mayer article and some blogging by Professor Oren Kerr of George Washington have gone on and on about what a fundamental uh, and I'll say the word again, kind of silly mistake a few of the judges have made here. Um, and I'll double down, right? If there's malware that's deployed in one of your client's cases, the odds are it's deployed because they cannot get information that is inside a closed computer that they want to crack open, right? To call that not a search just kind of defies understanding. Okay. And uh, because the Arterbury Court out of Oklahoma, I think, uh, uh, address this argument and uh, demolished it so effectively. I think it's one of the reasons the government decided not to appeal Arterbury. Uh, they've been very uh, strategic, as, as they are, and I guess as they should be, uh, about which cases are going up. And Arterbury uh, is not going to be reviewed by the Court of Appeals. All right. Now, uh, I am going to turn uh, in a little bit of depth to the discovery litigation. Uh, first of all, because I think it translates uh, to uh, all these type of cases. It's not playpen specific. Uh, anytime you're confronted with a hacking incident or a government malware uh, deployment, I, I think a lot of these discovery issues are going to be uh, at play in your case. And uh, often by trial and error, because I had no real familiarity with the classified information procedure, Act, which we'll get into uh, prior to this litigation. Uh, we ultimately had some success with this in terms of getting the Michaud case, our first case, dismissed outright, and uh, the uh, all, all the counts with mandatory minimums uh, dismissed in our most recent case uh, during the trial itself. All right, so 
broadly speaking, when you're, when you're dealing with discovery and trying to get at the NIT components or the equivalent uh, in whatever type of technologically sophisticated search situation that you're dealing with, uh, what the key issue at, at the core of all of it is going to be to establish the materiality of the information that you're seeking. Uh, and in particular, uh, at least in terms of our cases, how, how the discovery that you're seeking, the source code, the components, whatever is at issue, is, is material to defenses at trial. Uh, because the government, in terms of its resistance, uh, when it came to uh, disclosing that these were tort cases or NITs were involved, that resistance paled in comparison uh, to their resistance to actually giving us uh, access uh, to the NIT components, uh, to the point uh, that they were willing to take dismissals rather than uh, disclose. Uh, so really we establish certain broad themes that will be, I think, applicable to a lot of uh, certainly child pornography cases, but computer cases and malware involved cases in general. And, and they really came down to uh, some simple points. Um, one is we argued that we believed or had reason to believe uh, that the NIT may have compromised the security settings uh, on our client's computer. Uh, secondly, if that was the case, uh, the computer itself was then vulnerable to viruses and third-party attacks or hacking by people other than the government, uh, which could explain uh, a lot of the activity uh, and a f uh, criminal conduct that was involved in the case. I don't want to go too far uh, into the details of the specific allegations. Um, but anyway, so that with the compromised security settings and the vulnerability, now we had a whole host of potential defenses of where images came from, how they got onto the computer. Uh, in one case, uh, a lot of the uh, pornography had been found on a thumb drive, but our experts established that, well, basically anything that was infecting the computer uh, would uh, potentially uh, affect anything that was networked to the, uh, to the computer, including storage devices like a thumb drive. Uh, fourth, very importantly, and this became critical at trial in our second case, uh, you can't reverse engineer this stuff. And what I mean is that uh, the government did agree to give us a mirror image uh, hard copy of our client's hard drive in both cases for analysis and uh, took the position that that would lead us to identify any legitimate forensic issues related to the NIT. Uh, and our experts were consistent with this and in fact, uh, as I'll get to WikiLeaks uh, and the CIA helped uh, corroborate <laughs> it, uh, is that the NITs and this type of malware are frequently designed to defeat forensic analysis or reverse engineering of the type that the government itself was insisting would satisfy our discovery needs. Uh, and then fifth, that a lot of the red herrings I referred to, such as the data stream or the partial payload that was given to us, was insufficient for us to prepare for trial. Uh, so we developed those themes uh, throughout the discovery litigation, which was uh, protracted, and really went after uh, often feeling our way certain, certain aspects. Obviously, NIT components themselves, uh, for the reasons I've stated, the operation pacifier statistics, uh, the number of computers infected, the number of people visiting the site to develop the outrageous conduct issues. Uh, and then, of course, the operational records. Uh, we wanted to look at a virtual copy of the website. That's how we got to the Franks issue and the appearance of the home page at the relevant time period. Uh, the site administration records, including uh, information about how the site was improved. All that was wrapped up in our uh, discovery uh, litigation. So there was a lot of, lot of different factual issues and potential defenses and themes at issue. Uh, and it's important uh, to put as many of those out there in front of the judge uh, so that uh, he or she can really get a grasp of how fundamental uh, this discovery is to preparing an adequate defense. Uh, we got some help, help from Mozilla itself. Uh, they moved to intervene uh, as a kind of a third party in some of the discovery litigation. And uh, Mozilla makes the, uh, f the, the uh, Firefox a Tor browser that's typically bundled with your Tor download. Uh, and they put right in the brief that the information contained in the declaration of the lead special case agent, so they're citing the government's own declarations back at them, uh, suggests that the government exploited the very type of vulnerability or defect in the Tor browser that would allow third parties to obtain 
total control of a computer. Uh, so if you think about the idea of a third party gaining total control of your client's computer, uh, that obviously has a lot of appeal uh, to the extent that you may be able to uh, shift responsibility for certain images or uh, searches or anything that's going on with the computer uh, onto third party hackers. So, so to put a fine point on this, uh, you, you needed experts, you needed Mozilla, yes. Yes. right? It took kind of a technological village to craft the discovery motions that you were bringing, right? I mean, it seems like it was an important part of this case for you. It is. We ended up using, I think, five different experts. Uh, Mozilla intervened. Uh, quite frankly, uh, some of the government's experts under cross-examination proved to be the most helpful mm -hmm. because uh, once we were sufficiently primed on these issues, uh, the people that they were bringing in really had to concede a lot of these basic principles about vulnerabilities, uh, the prevalence of third-party hacking, uh, particularly in child pornography cases. I mean, one of the practices that's out there is that uh, uh, distributors of child pornography will remotely store a lot of their images on uh, people's computers to avoid the very type of tracing and uh, centralization that comes uh, with a typical website. So uh, once we got the government's experts in many cases to concede those points, uh, it was helpful to us. Now, one of the problems uh, is uh, that uh, there, are, there are walls built up within the Department of Justice uh, itself. Uh, this is uh, references an article by Brad Heath uh, from U.S. Today based on some uh, FOIA records that were released uh, during the course of our litigation. And uh, what it basically uh, describes is how uh, some of the technical experts at the FBI uh, simply will not share information with the line prosecutors or case agents about uh, what is actually going on with NITs or a lot of this sophisticated malware uh, to avoid leaks or disclosures of, of various kinds. And so what you get with that is that a lot of the time uh, the AUSA is standing up in the courtroom making, or the case agent making representations about what a NIT did or did not do, uh, really has no basis of knowledge for that, apart from the fact they didn't design the NIT, uh, they weren't involved in the deployment of the NIT. Uh, in fact, uh, they are being intentionally segregated uh, from a lot of the technical information that is material to these type of cases. And uh, we're seeing, again, a lot of this type of misinformation in other contexts. A lot of you may be uh, familiar with the Stingray cases and cell site simulators where information was had withheld from local law enforcement, judges, defense attorneys, all sorts of gaps in terms of what was being relayed or disclosed. And, and many of those cases are now being overturned on appeal. All right, so just a few basics then in terms of developing um, uh, the uh, issues around uh, the discovery. Uh, and the starting point, is, of course, is Rule 16 uh, and uh, the discovery rule. Uh, and Yates versus United States is a great case, 135 Supreme Court, 1074. Uh, and where the Supreme Court very clearly held that Rule 16 is a discovery rule uh, that is designed to protect defendants by compelling disclosure of anything that may be helpful uh, to the defense. Uh, the Ninth Circuit has picked up uh, on this as well, and so have a lot of other districts, uh, a lot of other circuits. This isn't unique language, but the rules are uh, written in categorical terms uh, where uh, the government must disclose anything that has material to preparing the defense. And you're not required to spell out your theory of your defense in order to obtain discovery. As a practical matter, you actually may be, uh, because unless you educate the judge on the issues that I indicated, potential trial defenses, issues related to NIT vulnerabilities, uh, the judge is probably not going to grasp why this may be helpful to your defense. Uh, so there really was a, a fair amount of balancing between disclosing our def trial strategy and getting discovery, which weighed in favor favor of spelling this out for the judge. Uh, but you're really not compelled to do that. Uh, Budziak is a great case from the Ninth Circuit which talks about how we are basically entitled to information that is relevant to cross-examination of anybody who's involved with designing or operating software or computer-related technology. Uh, and again, I think there are other cases in other circuits that mirror that. Uh, and again, uh, the Ninth Circuit probably has gone, you know, as far as one expects the Courts of Appeals to go, given that it is the Ninth Circuit. Uh, and they did got, said that it would, is in fact incomprehensible for the prosecution to tender a witness about the operation of uh, software or computer code uh, without the defense having the opportunity to examine it. All right. Uh, Jenks, uh, building on the discovery notions, go back to the basics. Uh, cite these principles to your judge, the rationale of the criminal case, 
uh, is that uh, basically we're entitled to anything that might be helpful to our defense. Uh, it's important for judges to be reminded of these core discovery principles and not to have uh, their uh, judgment clouded by the notions of national security and law enforcement exemptions and all the things that the government is going to throw in terms of the parade of horrors uh, that arises from discovery. It is important to remind the courts about these court principles, core principles. Uh, Jenks uh, goes on to talk about how a case must be dismissed uh, if uh, material discovery is not produced. And this, um, along with some of the language of the SEPA that I'll get to in a moment, uh, the Classified Information Procedures Act, were really uh, what we were aiming at. Uh, we wanted, uh, if we were not going to get the, the NIT components disclosed, uh, and we were pretty uh, sure that the government was never going to disclose them, then our goal was, in fact, uh, dismissal of the charges. All right, let's talk a little bit about the Classified Information Procedures Act. This is going to be a very truncated overview. Uh, I'm just going to give you a broad sense of how this uh, will affect uh, your discovery litigation because uh, the NIT, uh, in the course of our discovery litigation, probably in response to it, was uh, formally classified, and a lot of this type of malware and software will be as we go forward. But I think it's important to, to kind of emphasize it wasn't, as far as we know, when they first used the name. That's correct. So in the course of litigation, they decided to go back and classify the technology. So. And there's really no way to second guess that or, yeah. uh, or demonstrate to the judge, apart from the timing that was maybe done uh, for, um, you know, uh, less than appropriate purposes. The court certainly cannot uh, second guess a classification uh, decision. But uh, SEPA is, in fact, a very friendly, defendant friendly statute, and properly uh, deployed, uh, it can really uh, help a defendant even in the face of a classification claim. So uh, I'm not going to walk you through the entire statute, but just give you a little a sense that, first of all, you have to establish if the information is discoverable. That goes back to the materiality and trial defenses that uh, they were trying to develop, which we presented to the judge uh, through expert declarations uh, in terms of the potential issues that might come up, both for pretrial motions and ultimately for trial. The government, uh, if, the, if, if the information is discoverable, uh, there has to be a formal state secrets claim filed by the Attorney General. It actually didn't happen in our case uh, for reasons that are unclear to me. The judge decided to proceed anyway under the SEPA rubric. Um, the uh, SEPA provides for protective orders. We offered uh, the government to abide by any restrictions uh, that they thought were appropriate as long as we could analyze the NIT components. We even got a single uh, expert with national security uh, clearance who had agreed to uh, review the code at a government secure government facility, uh, but there was nothing that would satisfy the government. But it was important for us uh, to demonstrate that we we're willing to do uh, everything uh, reasonable short of giving up on the discovery demands themselves in order to uh, protect any legitimate law enforcement or national security interests that were related uh, to the um, code. All right. Uh, so now, if the government is still not going to buy, agree to a protective order or disclose, uh, then Section uh, 6 uh, provides uh, kind of an outline of where things are heading. Uh, the government can request a hearing um, to make all determinations regarding uh, the use or disclosure of classified information. The government uh, may offer substitute admissions or a summary. Uh, you'll see this will become uh, important in a moment in terms of our, our Tippins case. Um, and then if that is not sufficient, if you can demonstrate that the substitute emissions or summary of facts or information that the government is providing is not sufficient to put your client in substantially the same position that he or she would be uh, with full disclosure, uh, then uh, the court then has to consider uh, what relief is appropriate if the government continues in its opposition to disclosure. And, and this is, uh, 6 E of CEPA is a, is a marvelous provision. And basically what it tells you is that uh, if the substitute summary or admission is not sufficient uh, because it doesn't put the defendant in the same position in terms of preparing for motions or trial, uh, then and the government continues to refuse to provide discovery, then the court shall, in fact, dismiss the indictment uh, or, uh, in the interests of justice, uh, order some other relief, including dismissing specific counts or striking or precluding testimony. The, so these are mandatory uh, provisions of relief that are available to you under SEPA. 
And again, it's an indication of why I uh, characterize it as a defendant-friendly uh, statute if you can frame uh, the evidentiary issues, the potential defenses, in a persuasive way. Now, in our first case, uh, the Michaud case, uh, the judge excluded all fruits of the NIT search, which, which was effectively our, the entire case, um, by uh, finding that the NIT code was material. Uh, at this point, interestingly enough, the government had not uh, classified the NIT. They were relying on a law enforcement exemption and other uh, provisions to keep it secret. But the short of it is that the judge found it material and that um, while the, in the, I'm reading from the opinion, the government asserts the NIT will not be helpful. The information may well be a uh, treasure trove. So we got one case dismissed. Uh, the government came back by offering a stipulation under SEPA that is possible an exploit could make temporary or permanent changes to security settings. Uh, this was supposedly to allow us to raise our trial defenses. Um, the problem with that is that while they uh, gave us the uh, stipulation, it of course uh, really didn't mean much when the government is coming back during trial and saying, well, it's possible, but really it's all just speculative. It's theorizing on the part of the defense because they have no evidence to show <laughs> that the NIT actually did these things. Well, of course, we don't have the evidence uh, because uh, we weren't given it. So in our Tacoma playpen trial, uh, we emphasized uh, that there were specific image files that were alleged. Uh, the timing and uh, intent behind these various uh, downloads or receipts or transportation were critical. And uh, we could not really determine the reliability of metadata, timestamps, other information about how the uh, images got on our client's computer uh, because of the potential that the NIT had created new vulnerabilities or even changed or altered data on the computer itself related to the timestamps. Now, uh, I'm going to skip over this next slide, uh, which gets a little bit into the weeds and some of the email issues, and just let you give you about two minutes an overview of how this played out. Uh, in the course of the trial, the government did, in fact, uh, make the argument that our concerns were speculative, despite the stipulation that it had entered into. Uh, but uh, WikiLeaks had released a trove of CIA documents approximately a week before trial started, and uh, those uh, documents uh, directly contradicted certain premises that the government was presenting to the judge. So, for example, uh, in the WikiLeaks documents, you will find references to the fact that NITs or NIT types uh, malware is designed to resist or evade forensic analysis or reverse engineering, which pulled the rug out of the entire argument the government had been making about how all we needed to do was look at our client's hard drive to determine if there were vulnerabilities or um, uh, problems in terms of timestamps. Uh, and uh, it was in the course of presenting this and the government uh, asking for a timeout and closed court proceedings that the judge ultimately determined uh, that without discovery and given this corroboration of what an NIT is capable of doing and its ability to evade review, uh, the government had to elect uh, between uh, disclosure and uh, dismissals. So that is just a quick overview, and I'm happy to talk in more detail about anybody with anybody who has a, a playpen case. There are lots of uh, pleadings and transcripts available to uh, kind of flesh out uh, this strategy, uh, but uh, it's important to bear in mind that you need to start developing these themes early uh, in order to persuade the judge as to the materiality of the discovery itself. Great. So we really do want to kind of leave a little time at the end in case there are questions that uh, we know we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, but what I think I'd like to do is kind of take two slides, uh, and we're going to really kind of leave the specific playpen context now, uh, and I'm going to put on my geeky law professor hat and talk a little bit more about um, issues that kind of didn't come up in any of the other places, and then speculatively just think about uh, what's going to happen with the government use of malware going forward. Okay, so let's start with some legal issues. This is really a grab bag of things that may arise. But um, in, the, uh, in the Playpen case and in other cases, there have always been search warrants, as far as we know. Um, and in fact, in some of these cases, there have been wiretap orders as well. Um, one thing to remember is, you know, when you think about exploit versus payload, what the payload does on the computer, we spend a lot of time and energy characterizing as a search. But it might be more than a search. It might be a wiretap. Um, and so if you have any indication in your case that the malware, for example, turned on a microphone, 
Uh, well, now you're talking about kind of oral contents of communications, and you're squarely within the Federal Wiretap Act, 18 U.S.C. 2511. Um, and for those of you who haven't done a lot of cases, although I'm, I'm guessing a lot of you have, involving wiretap, remember, this is kind of the highest hurdle that we have in the federal code and in state code uh, for conducting surveillance. And so, uh, sure, you might need a warrant to install the exploit. You might need a warrant to root around on the hard drive. You're going to need more if you're turning on that microphone. Um, okay, so that's step one. Uh, remember also that there are a kind of number of appellate cases that extend the Wiretap Act uh, to things like video cameras. Uh, so if the malware, as malware can do, turns on the camera on a laptop or on a smartphone, uh, they're also going to need Wiretap Act-like authority under the Fourth Amendment. Um, the other good thing to say about both of these avenues is that we're really talking about both statutory and constitutional suppression uh, if they fail to abide by the really, really high hurdles of wiretap. Um, I've got pen register on this slide. It probably doesn't bear much discussion. Pen register um, is the non-content equivalent to the Wiretap Act. It's the authority needed uh, to do non-content, real-time, contemporaneous tracking, for example, of all the numbers you dial on, on a telephone. Uh, so I suppose it might be in some cases that in order to kind of have the payload sit and here's one example, uh, record every to and from in an email inbox. Um, well, then the government also needs to go get a pen register to staple to that search warrant. Why is that not going to be really relevant for uh, about as many reasons as there are minutes in the data list? Pen register is a really, 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 really low standard. Um, it's a really kind of powerful authority. Some judges have described their role in approving pen registers um, as purely ministerial. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, there's no statutory suppression and probably no constitutional suppression for pen register violations. Um, okay, so that's the first set of legal issues. Number two, um, up until this point, all of our examples have been the government reaching out in a kind of first party direct way and grabbing information using malware directly from a computer or device. Uh, and in fact, all of those recorded cases that I had on that timeline fit that mold. Um, but Apple v. FBI, which I kind of teed up at the very beginning, which again ended up with a piece of malware um, providing the last step in the investigation, is an example of what I think might be a trend that we see coming, which is the government has the piece of malware, the government has the target that they can't get through conventional means, they want to deploy the malware, but they can't do it on their own. They need the participation of a company like Google, or they need the participation of the target's cell phone provider, or they need the participation of a device manufacturer like Apple. And in every one of those cases, uh, a mere search warrant may not do the trick for a couple of reasons. Number one, the search warrant kind of gives you the authority to search where you want to search, but it doesn't necessarily obligate some third party, some innocent bystander, or some company like Google, Apple, or Verizon uh, to participate in the search, to lend you assistance. Um, that's kind of the first reason why you're going to kind of maybe see this crop up in cases. The second reason is there's just this trend among Silicon Valley giant companies, uh, not as consistency, consistently as I would like, but uh, with increasing frequency standing up to government requests that they see as overburdensome or too broad. Um, so it might be, and in fact, there's kind of hints of this in flight, and it may be that a company like Mozilla feels like it has some vested interest um, and is willing to come to your aid. Okay, so if that's going to happen, what are kind of two, and I'll just tee up these issues. In the Apple v. FBI case, the legal issue that was brought to bear was the All Writs Act, uh, the kind of uh, 1800s era law that basically tells the government uh, in, in furtherance of a lawful order like a search warrant, you can also get third parties to help you and assist you in the execution of that warrant. Um, there's an old Supreme Court case called New York Telephone where the Supreme Court said uh, with an All Writs Act attached to a warrant, a telephone company is obligated to help you uh, effect, in that case, a pen register. Um, but as many of you no doubt saw in the debate that played out in the press and in court, uh, Apple really resisted uh, complying with an All Writs Act order. There's also this other case, and I'll just point you to the citation and have you take a look at it. Um, this is particularly, this is out of the Ninth Circuit, it's called The Company. Um, this was 
can you take a company like OnStar, now we don't know for sure that this was OnStar, uh, that supplies a in-car kind of GPS concierge service, can you with a wiretap order force them to turn the microphone on in the car? Uh, and the Ninth Circuit actually said you cannot. The Wiretap Act does not give you enough authority to do that, particularly because in that case, when they turned the microphone on, because of their system architecture, they made it impossible to dial 911. Um, and so that's how that kind of case played out. Um, the kind of last legal issue I'll present you with um, refers to one last thing that we kind of made available with the slides. Ahmed Gapoor, a law professor, um, uh, has written an article, a very nice article in the Stanford Law Review that kind of highlights the fact that especially with the Tor Hidden Services, the odds are really high that what we're talking about here is an international search. Um, and to be quite candid with a bunch of kind of defenders who might be watching this, he really kind of focuses his attention on Congress and how we might enact legislation to avoid literally international incidents from occurring. Um, he doesn't really give much thought or, or ink on the page to wh what this might look like in court, whether there are motions to suppress. So I leave that as an exercise for the viewer, uh, but it is a really nice recitation of kind of the international issues. And then here's where I'm getting really, really speculative. Um, and so I'll just kind of highlight these. And again, we can talk about more in Q&A. Um, I am actually writing an article. It wasn't available to share with you yet, but I'd be happy to share w uh, with people who ask later on via email. My email is on the last slide. I'm writing an article that kind of at the tail end on slide 52 of a, uh, a, a presentation that's frankly quite pessimistic about um, kind of cabining the government's ability to do all sorts of aggressive things. I've written an article that gives us a tiny sliver of optimism, and this article basically says, you know what, viruses are something that the government are, is really reluctant to use except in important cases. Uh, I don't have the kind of full time here to give you the entire story, but let me give you a tiny piece of it. Uh, as Colin has suggested, a lot of these vulnerabilities that are identified come from the shadowy sides of national security investigations. Uh, and so here you have the kind of natural tension and rivalry between that dark side and the light side of law enforcement. You can tell them former law enforcement. Um, and, and the kind of intelligence national security side isn't always eager uh, because of SEPA and other reasons to share kind of their vulnerabilities and exploits with the law enforcement side. So where does that cash out? It just means the government is always going to have some sort of internal check. Now, of course, the internal checks aren't perfect. I'd prefer there to be like a congressional check uh, that'll stop, for example, this from being something that's used in every case uh, or in every investigation. Congress has been urged to think about this in the wake of the Rule 41 proposals. There were a few kind of proposals to roll back the Rule 41 change. Congress, at least from my read, isn't showing a lot of interest in legislating in this space. Um, I will also say that this, to me, feels like a prime target for what I heard, have heard some call a magistrate's mm -hmm. vault. Uh, the idea that the magistrate judges of this country kind of, for all sorts of great reasons, now see themselves as the great bastion of protecting some of our civil liberties, particularly under, under the Fourth Amendment. Um, and some of the good opinions we've talked about here come from magistrate judges like working really hard, talking to one another, sharing briefs um, about what to do with these really tricky cases that they're seeing. The last one is a mouthful, and boy, I'm just going to do a little more than define it. Um, there's a whole other debate about the government's stockpiling and purchasing of vulnerabilities that if you type vulnerabilities, equities, process, you'll see one part of that debate play out. But the bottom line question in two sentences is, if I find out that Microsoft Windows is seriously compromised and I'm the US government, do I have an obligation to tell Microsoft? Should I stockpile it to use against our kind of national security enemies? Should I stockpile it to use against for, uh, future criminal suspects? That's the debate that's playing out under this kind of mouthful of a title. OK. I think we've said plenty. I think we've said a ton. Here are our email addresses if you have questions and phone numbers for us. Uh, questions? All right. Thank you to both of you. Uh, that was quite a mouthful. Again, you can, <laughs> a mouthful, a headful. Um, you can send questions to me at jmusa at nacdl.org. Um, and just to start off for you, uh, there's a question about when you're looking for experts. It's sort of a two-parter. One is, how do you suggest assessing what background the expert needs in order to be qualified to testify? And the second part is, how much information do you need to have from the government before the expert ought to be hired? 
you know, it, it, it's a challenge. Uh, you know, as I indicated, we ended up using uh, five experts in our uh, playpen litigation, uh, partly because there's really no one expert who can cover all the various issues. Um, also because uh, at least one of our experts, I think, went back to work for the NSA, uh, and so we had to replace him. Uh, but he was very valuable while he lasted. Uh, but in any event, uh, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of legwork. Uh, that's why a working group like we have with Playpen is helpful, because we can share that information. I've even asked Paul if he's uh, <laughs> going to do any outside consulting. Uh, you know, often uh, what we need, and certainly in the course of the discovery litigation, is experts to comment on information that has not been provided and to demonstrate why the information we are requesting is, first of all, frame correctly, that we're asking for the right things. I mean, when we started out, our original discovery letter asked for the NIT source code. Uh, that wasn't a very, uh, you know, accurate uh, or tight way to uh, develop our demands. And so, you know, we got experts to explain the components and, and brief the judge on what, how each of them operated and why they were important. So the experts are absolutely essential. Uh, you know, we need to network as much as possible on the available experts, and I'm certainly to share. Uh, uh, you know, happy to share um, the expert declarations that we've developed. Uh, one caveat on that, because of the way the protective order worked in my case, we are limited uh, to sharing uh, sealed information with uh, only those defendants, only those attorneys who have active uh, NIT cases, uh, Operation Pacifier cases pending, uh, and even that doesn't pertain to a lot of the stuff that's been under protective orders or sealed. So we're dealing with some restrictions as well in terms of sharing information uh, and developing experts that, uh, you know, the courts have Posed, you know, often for legitimate reasons, uh, but um, uh, you know, experts, bottom line is experts are essential to explain both why information that you have is important and e even more importantly, information you don't have and why it's needed. Yeah, I, just to forestall a thousand email messages, I, <laughs> uh, the answer the answer I gave is I'm I'm probably not rushing into doing a lot of expert uh, testimony and assistance. I will say that uh, we're talking, as Colin said, about a broad set of skills and technical topics that you need to like look into. But there are cybersecurity professionals all across this country who know bits and pieces of what would be relevant. Uh, and so you know, use networks, try and find the people in your local community. Uh, but I think you know I happen to know some of the people that Colin has engaged. They're really world class people who are amazing at this, but I think there probably are quite a few people who can at least help you with theories of the case, uh, if not also be the person to write your declarations. And, and let me just add one caveat. Uh, be careful. I mean, I have also seen expert declarations or been contacted by experts who, uh, or, who claim to be experts that are, are clearly not qualified right. uh, to deal with these issues. Uh, uh, so again, referrals, uh, looking at uh, people's, obviously their CVs and, and references are, are going to be essential. I, I've seen a few cases that uh, really have not been helped by their so-called experts as well. Right. All right. So um, the next question we have, it comes back to the question of uh, not so much the experts, but the judges who are hearing the cases. Um, and so when it comes to sort of technology and science, especially the older, perhaps, I will say perhaps, the older generation of judges tend to tune out when the arguments get too technical. So what advice do you have to make the information or the argument clear and accessible to judges? Well, uh, you know, let me start with, uh, you know, a comment I made earlier that I'm not a tech person myself, and, uh, you know, I think in some ways that is potentially an advantage, uh, because uh, if I can't get to the point of understanding uh, how Tor works or the what the components do uh, in simple, non-technical terms, then I'm not going to be able to explain it to a judge or jury. Uh, but the flip side of that is if I can articulate it, uh, then uh, there's a good chance they're going to get it, particularly with, you know, adequate graphics. And, and good experts walking them through the process. Uh, but it is painstaking. It's important to avoid jargon. Uh, it is important to use illustrations. It's really important to translate these things into kind of bread and butter analogies. So, you know, that little, uh, you know, map about how, you know, often when you phone home from with your computer to a server, uh, you know, and that's a public number versus, you know, it being put through these virtual tunnels. These kind of analogies or similes and illustrations are, are critical. But I think if you're prepared to kind of just think that through and avoid jargon, uh, the judges will ultimately get it. What, you know, look, our, the judge in our Tacoma cases uh, is on senior status. He's in his 80s, does not uh, have a technical background, uh, but he is an attentive judge. Uh, he cares about his rulings, and uh, as long as he's willing to put the time into it, I think your judges uh, will ultimately get this if it 
presented in nice, simple terms. Yeah, and I, I mean, <laughs> I certainly don't have the kind of experience in front of the courtroom to uh, to kind of opine on on what I think Colin said, which is perfectly uh, correct. But I do think a lot about this question of how do we transmit information about complex technology, and I think a lot of it starts with the litigants. Sorry to say it. Whenever I see a judge really, really, really mess up. Um, a technology, I will often look at the briefs and find that the kind of litigants didn't understand the technology. So it really starts with the lawyers and it starts with the experts. Um, I think that even though Tor and Hidden Services are really complex, we're talking about really approachable kind of, this isn't like deep telecom knowledge, this is security and viruses and things that, as Colin says, if you grab the right metaphor, you can really hit home what's happening here. Uh, but at the end of the day, some of it is just going to be hard study and surrounding yourself with the time and the people you need to really understand this yourself. So. Okay, so the next question, which I'm uh, slightly editing, is beyond child porn cases and terrorism cases, yeah. Considering the changes to Rule 41, how expansive do you think government hacking is or will be? Um, is this something we'll see in white-collar cases, other types of cases? So, again, I mean, this goes to my last slide where I talked about why I don't think this is going to be a, a massive wave. I think there's going to be a lot more of these cases every year, let's be clear. Um, I also think they're going to go way beyond child pornography. And so the Silk Road case itself um, involves some malware aspects. There was a second takedown recently, the name is Escaping Me, um, of another really notorious uh, website for buying meth online um, in the dark net. Um, the predicate for any investigation is, is the target taking steps to make it difficult to find their identity? Uh, and so what types of crimes can you map that onto? Probably just about any crime. Uh, white collar, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm sure we will see before too long um, a sophisticated white collar kind of conspiracy or individual uh, who cannot be found through conventional means and malware will be deployed. Um, so. Yeah, and one thing to bear in mind, I think really the only only practical restraint at this point that I'm aware of is kind of the cost-benefit analysis. The FBI, as far as I know, and I think there's a consensus, is not developing this stuff on their own. Uh, it can be expensive, it's labor-intensive, it's used for national security purposes. Uh, and that's part of the reason I think we got so much pushback on the playpen cases is because they were probably borrowing some type of national security uh, software and there was really no way in heck that uh, whoever was really behind the development of the NIT was going to allow uh, any aspect of it to get out. Uh, and, and, and so ultimately that did play to our advantage, and I think that may be some restraint on using uh, this type of sophisticated malware in, in kind of routine domestic criminal cases. But uh, beyond that, um, you know, we've seen the lengths to which the uh, law enforcement is willing to go once they have these tools. Well, and let's be sure to connect this to the entire going dark encryption debate, right? So as devices are easier to use, I mean, our story has mostly been about Tor, but we could have easily talked about whole disk encryption. Um, the government is going to increasingly run into cases that lead to devices that are dead ends. Uh, and there's a lot of litigation right now about can we lock someone up and compel them to give their passcode. The other avenue is can we find a virus to break into this machine. Uh, and so although the device issues are slightly different than the network issues we focused on, I think you're going to see a lot of those cases. And then those cases are going to cover every type of crime you can imagine. So not just kiddie porn for sure. Okay, and I'm going to take the privilege of the last question to myself, which is more sort of on the technical end. Yeah. But in, in sort of approaching these cases, obviously they said, well, you know, this NIT is, is top secret. We can't share it. We can't have it be open. Um, some technologists I've talked to would suggest that, you know, once it's been used and deployed the way it has, it's probably not even effective anymore at this point. Um, you know, obviously they, expected, they, they exploited something in Mozilla, which may, or in Firefox, which maybe Mozilla didn't know at the time, but they sure know now. Yeah. And so, you know, is there sort of a technical argument against this idea that they cannot share the exploit, you know, for it would damage national security or whatever other sort of parade of horribles is put out there? Uh, there, there certainly is. I mean, I, I, once you know, once the, it was announced that Mozilla had uh, patched its browser, and it was, from all the indications, it was the vulnerability that that was involved in the NIT. We immediately filed a motion, uh, you know, bringing that to the attention of the judge and saying, "Well, look, you know, any national security interest they've claimed is probably diminished or moot at this point." The problem is uh, that judges are very, very reluctant to insert themselves into classification procedures or national security analysis. Um, uh, when uh, there is an assertion that there is some parade of horrors that might result uh, from a disclosure. And of course, I don't know what that parade of horrors is because it was presented to the judge ex parte. So, uh, you know, yes, uh, should be, be 
people pushing on whether or not this is still a zero day, to use a term of art, or, or something that's already kind of outlived its, its utility. Uh, but, you know, I think it's hard uh, to get discovery in the face of a classification claim. That's why I focused on the remedies section, because you, you need to turn that non-disclosure to your advantage. Yeah, and the only thing I would add to that is, uh, you know, this is a, a broader story about the way the government talks about classification, the way they talk about state secrets, right? So the idea is, well, even if, for example, this isn't an exploit that is going to work a lot, it might work on people who have really old computers or, or might work on people who aren't paying attention or the, the sheer revelation that it came from us is a separate secret above and apart from the vulnerability. So, uh, you know, the problem with this is it's all shrouded in so many layers of misdirection and doctrine um, that it's a really daunting thing to run up against. Like if you run into malware and classification comes into play, even with the nice tools of SEPA, you've got an uphill, uh, you know, climb at that point. There's a, there's a lot in your way uh, to having the success that Colin did. So it's credit for him that uh, he convinced a judge to kind of buy the arguments, to accept the arguments. Well done. Lock of the draw, too. we got a good judge. <laughs> good. All right. So I was wrong. There's one last question, and then, you know, each maybe take 30 seconds to wrap up. Yeah. Uh, the last question is, are you aware of some of the playpen cases being referred to state prosecutors, and is there a list of these available? Uh, I do not. I am aware that that is happening uh, in my district because they have stopped filing them in our court because of where the litigation ended up. So, And with all the NIT cases are now being referred to the same judge, so we're not getting any more of them. Uh, so there have been some referrals to the state in my district. Uh, um, and I think they're out there. I'm just uh, most of uh, the information that has been shared with the working group has been among uh, federal defense attorneys uh, because that's where all the action um, has kind of been above the radar. But they're, they're out there. I just haven't seen very many of them yet. Yeah, nothing to add on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any wrap-up? Yeah. No. Happy to take, uh, you know, again, questions by email or if people get one of these cases to, to hook you into the work. Yeah, and the, the last two quick things I'll say is, you know, I think a lot, not just about malware, but about kind of technology and networks and how we can kind of train public defenders and train lots of people to think about technology accurately. If you want to engage me on those issues, by all means, please send me an email. Uh, the second thing I'll just add with an advertisement for Jonathan Mayer's article. Um, it's rare that I tell a practitioner to read a 70-page law review article, but it's kind of uniquely and usually grounded in doctrine and practical advice. Uh, so I think you'll get a lot of benefit from looking through that article. All right. Well, on behalf of NACDL, I'd like to thank uh, both Colin and Paul and all of you uh, who logged on today. This will be up online. You, of course, have your materials. And please don't forget to fill out your surveys. Thank you.